Hello and welcome. And when I say welcome, I really mean it because I have been calling this neighborhood home for 25 years and now it really feels like I am hosting you all. But unlike, uh, unlike many hospitable Turks, instead of offering you delicious food and amazing drinks, I will offer you some of the science that I have been doing in my masters. So not as delicious as, um, and as filling, but hopefully as good. And the science I have been doing in the end of my master's was trying to improve the generalizability of drug target affinity prediction models. And we have come up with a training framework called the bias DTA, and today I want to talk about it. But before improving the generalizability of those models, why do we even need drug target affinity prediction models? Okay, sorry, there is like a, oops. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It, it, it all, it's all about the drug discovery pipeline. And let me briefly explain what we do in, in a typical drug discovery pipeline. A typical drug discovery pipeline starts with target identification, where uh, the researchers identify often a protein target that will, whose modulation would helpfully cure a disease. And once you have your target, you start finding some promising chemicals for that target that would strongly bind to that target and modulate its behavior. And then, if, when you have some promising leads, what you do, you go to animal trials, and then the clinical trials, and then, in the end, you hopefully get your drug. But unfortunately, this is a very costly process that would cost billions of dollars, and also a very time-consuming process that would take more than 10 years. So, since we need our drugs and we need them fast, we need to accelerate this pipeline. And there is a lot that we can do to accelerate this pipeline in every single stage. But in this work, I will be talking about how we can accelerate this particular step where we, where we are trying to find some promising lead molecules, some bioactive compounds. And, but why, why, again, uh, do we need machine learning to find those uh, compounds? Because, well, the simple answer is that the chemical space is huge. Chemical space, or in other words, the set of all possible drugs like molecules is estimated to contain 10 to the 60 compounds. So to give, you a, a, to give you an idea of how large of a number this is, the number of stars in the observable universe is only around 10 to the 77. So yes, this is a huge space, and we definitely cannot explore this space chemical by chemical in a wet lab. So we need computational models that would guide our search, that would prioritize some chemicals for us that, so that we, should have a, we, we would have a narrower space to test in the lab, and in the end, we get uh, our molecules faster. And one way, to do is, uh, one way to do it is to use machine learning. And those models, uh, that are, uh, they are called affinity prediction models. So when, you, when, you, uh, when you're applying machine learning for affinity prediction, what you do, you first curate a data set of protein ligand pairs, or protein chemical pairs, and their corresponding affinity scores, or in other words, how strongly they would bind to each other. And once you have this data set, you train a machine learning model, and then you ask that machine learning model about a, an arbitrary protein chemical pair and how strongly they would bind. So yeah, at the moment, we have those models. We have drug target affinity prediction models, but th there is a catch with those models and it's called their generalizability. Well, let me explain what, what I mean by that. So now you have a drug target affinity prediction model that would be able to predict the affinity of any drug, any chemical protein pair. If, if both of the chemical and the protein is already available in your training set, your model actually would do just fine. It would have a decent prediction of the resulting affinity. But if your chemical or protein, either one of those, are unavailable in your training set, then your model will start to struggle, just like PowerPoint uh, struggling to show my emojis, actually. So, and if none of those proteins and chemicals are available in your training set, then the struggle will become so high that the prediction actually will become uh, almost random. So, we, so this means that the current models for the current drug target affinity prediction models that we have are struggling to generalize to unseen chemicals, unseen proteins, and unseen both. So, and this is actually very, th those cases are actually very relevant for drug discovery because, for instance, when you are designing a novel chemical, as in the previous study, you want then you're exactly in the realm of unseen chemical because, well, since it's a novel chemical, you have no training data for that. 
or if you are working on a rare, di rare disease with some novel proteins, then you are in the realm of uh, unseen protein. And if you are doing both, then yeah, you are really uh, stuck with uh, models that predict uh, random things. So we should fix that. And but before, before fixing that, we should understand why. Why is this the case? Why, do, why don't the models we have generalize to unseen molecules? And when we look at the literature to, uh, to find some answers, we see that it's notoriously tied with the data set biases. And what do I mean by that? The, what do I mean by data set biases is that outstanding and rewarding patterns that drive prediction models away from the task semantics. So they are outstanding, meaning that they are simple for models to pick up, and they are rewarding, meaning that they would actually minimize the loss of the machine learning model, and they're, they're also driving the, task, they're driving the model away from the task semantics, meaning that they are misleading. So they are bad, basically. And to, to give you an example, for instance, the identifiers of the molecules are actually a very good source of data set biases. Even if you are not using any ID of the molecules, uh, chemicals, and the proteins, the models are actually very good at capturing, this, memorizing the sequences of inputs, and then basing their predictions only on those memorized information. So basically on the ID of the chemical and the protein. And so when you ask, uh, ask, uh, ask, that, ask that model about a novel chemical, since they, they have never seen that molecule before, well, they will struggle because they only know how to predict based on the IDs. So we should mitigate uh, th those data set biases. And there are two approaches to that in the literature. One is called data set oriented approaches, where basically researchers are trying to split the data set so that test sets and training sets are uh, significantly different from each other, and then they would be hopefully capture the generalizability of the models or the struggles. But unfortunately, we know that th those uh, approaches are actually introducing a risk on degrading the model performance because they, they try to get rid of some data that is causing a problem. And well, data is very scarce in this domain, and we should definitely keep that. And another approach that we also explore is the model-oriented approach. And in this approach, instead of uh, meddling with the data sets, we actually focus on the model training framework. We, we try to find a training framework so that we could make the best out of the data set we have and we could have models that generalizes uh, better. And that's what we have done uh, in this work. The, we, we have proposed device DTA, a model training framework for improving the generalizability of drug target affinity prediction models. Device, in, the, in device DTA, we propose a two-stage training strategy. In the first stage, we propose training a model called the guide model to learn and avoid data set biases. And this model would output uh, something called importance coefficient so that another predictor, an actual drug target of interprediction model, could, could use those importance coefficients and guide its training and hopefully generalize better. Now let me go into the more detail. So I have talked one, the guide model. And the guide, again, it's actually another drug target of into prediction model that should learn data set biases only. So the guide model should learn data set biases, nothing else. And this means that it should be able to capture some simple and yet rewarding patterns. So it should be a weak learner. And it should use some weak representations. For instance, in this study, we experiment with a model that, that is called IDDTA, where we basically try to quantify the biomolecular identity-based biases, and we use one hot encoding of each molecule based on their IDs. And then we use regression trees, since they are very simple regressors that could capture outstanding patterns, and we, try, uh, we, we train IDDTA on our training set. And in the end, we measure how well IDDTA is doing on each training sample, and then we propose a heuristic. We propose that if this model, a model that is, uh, that is trained to learn data set biases only, is having high error on a training sample, it means that this training sample is actually containing some very valuable information, so it should be very important for our training. So high error on a training sample means high importance coefficients in the bias uh, DTA training framework. And then with this information and heuristic, we, we move on to the predict, uh, we move on training the predictor. And predictor can be any machine learning model for drug target affinity prediction. It, so it can use any representation, any, any model architecture, it can be an existing model or a novel model, it doesn't matter. 
We experiment with five different approaches. Uh, some use se uh, sequences, some use graphs. And then we train these predictors with, uh, with the importance coefficients learned by the guide model. And then uh, to recap, this is the uh, pipeline that uh, we are proposing. We have a model, we, then, we train, then we train the guide model on that. We learn some importance coefficients. And then using that importance coefficients, we train the predictor. And then we move on to experiments. We have tested uh, across 20 test sets of binding DB data set, and we have seen that on 80% of the test sets, the bias DTA can actually help improving the performance of the model. This is a very good and welcoming results. And maybe even more important, the performance increase was consistent across predictors, meaning that whether the model is using graph neural networks or, ne or fully connected neural networks or CNNs, the, the performance was increase was observed, meaning that the bias DTA is actually model and representation agnostic. And then we also happily observed that the, the performance increase was not only on the unseen part of the test set, but also on the seen uh, biomolecules, suggesting that the bias DTA is a training framework that overall improves the performance of a model. And then last not, but not Last but not least, we also uh, tested the performance of models trained with the bias DTA uh, on an out of data set test set, meaning that we have trained uh, our, data, uh, our models using BDB data and then tested on completely, uh, another completely different data set called Kiba. And again, uh, for five of the models, uh, for four out of five of the models, we have seen a performance increase, meaning that the bias DTA can handle the most challenging uh, set uh, two. And uh, since uh, the bias DTA is model agnostic and representation agnostic, and, I, and we think that it is actually very important to train the rectorac the fin prediction models that are generalizable, we actually published the bias DTA as a Python library that you can quickly install and train your own models uh, with, with, with this framework. So in short, I would say that generalizability is a major challenge for all affinity prediction models, regardless of their representation and architecture. And the bias DTA is the first approach that targets this problem, that the generalizability problem in the uh, direct target affinity prediction uh, domain. And hope, uh, luckily or happily, uh, it works, and its performance, is, uh, its success is model agnostic. But uh, we should also note that it's a first and small step uh, to achieve generalizable direct target affinity prediction models. I'm not claiming that, thanks to, the, uh, thanks to the bias DTA, we have now super generalizable models, but we see the bias DTA is a very good uh, first step in that direction, and we really want to uh, encourage more research uh, in this direction because we believe that there is much more to do. So. Uh, I, I want to thank all, all of my uh, lab members uh, and the funders uh, of this project. I should also note that we are actually not that chubby as a group. It's the projector that shows us shows our cheeks like that. We are in good shape. And yeah, uh, I want to thank everyone who contributed to this project and also the organizers of Recomp. And uh, thank you for listening. I want to have your questions if you have any. <laughs>